to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, we have Peter Lang, CPA, on the show. And this is not your ordinary CPA, folks. He is called the Designer CPA. That's right. Peter actually is doing in his CPA firm what we have discussed a gabillion times on this podcast, which is he has niched his firm. Wait to hear the story of how he decided to niche his firm. CPA firm to specifically interior designers. It's a really terrific story. I think you're going to enjoy it. And the other thing is, is that it's a great conversation because he actually understands the business model. So when you talk about, when I ask him a question about, you know, flat fees and there's a design fee and doesn't necessarily have costs associated with it, obvious costs, obvious your, your operating expenses, expenses are there, but he gets it. And then when you talk about that, your markup on product, it might be 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 percent, he gets it. He doesn't say, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> right? So it's an awesome conversation. And I I think you're going to learn a lot about it. The designer CPA, Peter Lang. And I want to mention that there were a couple of other episodes that I talked about in the podcast. So first of all is the episode with Michelle Williams, episode 180. Michelle Williams is a business coach that specializes also in interior designers and window treatment professionals, but she is also a certified profit first coach coach. And that was what we discussed in episode 180. Then we have Diane Gardner, who is a tax coach. She is not an accountant. She's a tax coach. It's a different skill set. Some CPAs like Peter function and add that layer to their um, the skill set and the offering and the services they, they give to you. But some accounts in stone, in which case you need a tax coach. So that was episode 54. And then we had Jody Paydar, the Radical CPA, episode 229, also a great CPA that looks at your firm all the way around from all sides. So if you are now struggling and you are trying to figure out how to hire your CPA or you're trying to figure out if you should let the one you have go because you're not feeling respected and you're not feeling like you understand the process, then all of these episodes are going to be helpful for you to pick up a little bit from each one of them to really round out your confidence and your understanding of how dramatically having the right professional beside you makes a difference in your business. In my recent book that I came out with, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, in I think it's chapter two, I talk about your dream team. Who are the non-negotiable experts that you must have as part of your business and your business plan? And the CPA is right there. It's one of them. Okay, so I'm looking forward to sharing this conversation with you. Peter Lang is uh, really a nice man. The designer CPA. Here we go. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of A Well-Designed Business on Power Talk Friday. I appreciate your coming on the show. Hi, Luann. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I was, you know, we've had quite a few, three, four different people in the couple of years that the show's been on uh, that are either tax coaches or CPAs and so forth. But you are the first one that I met that particularly specializes in interior designers. (laughs) Yes. Right? And so I thought to myself, huh, I know that we need to hear things two and three and four and five and six times before we get it. So I one hand, I don't mind re-interviewing people that are in the finance world and, t- and 
CPAs and so forth, because it is a complicated subject, and we do need to hear things more than a couple of times. But this particular specialty of yours, of specializing exactly in our field, was something I could not pass up. Well, that's good to hear. So. Yes, yes. So so the, one of the things I'd love for you to share before I start in on this whole discussion about uh, taxes and accounting and bookkeeping and things like that and finances for designers is there's a story where you were working at a, your typical cutthroat accounting firm and people were saying to you that you helped people too much. <laughs> Tell us yes. a little bit about that. <laughs> Yeah, so I I grew up in Rhode Island and then I moved to Boston and so I worked in a regional firm uh, in the Boston area for a little while and it was a completely different experience than what um, most people are used to. I When I had gotten promoted to senior, I thought that meant helping the staff and I got written up one day for the first time. I had gotten in trouble for the first time, maybe in my life. I couldn't believe it. And when I went to my boss, they said, you are helping people too much. You need to sit back down at your desk and just do your job without talking to anyone. And that's when I realized that I loved accounting. I love taxes, as boring as that sounds, (laughs) but I was going to do it my way. I was going to figure out the way to get it that I had my own business and do it my way, and I wanted to do it as soon as possible. Wow. That's something else, right? I mean, think about that. That's like – there's other examples. I can't think off the top of my head, but those types of things where the industry has a specific look on the way it's supposed to be done and don't get out of that lane. Just go put your head down and do it, right? Yes, and I hate I hate the uh, the stereotypical way we look, but uh, it, it 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 is what it is at this point. Yes, well, I have to say we've been very lucky on the show. I'll have to look up the different episode numbers, but we've been very lucky on the show that we have been meeting a lot of people like yourself that are this new breed of CPAs. You know, I'm thinking of. Uh, well, Diane Gardner is a tax coach. She's not a CPA. But then we had Jody Padar, the ra- radical CPA. We have Craig Cody. Um, you know, we have these people that are like yourself, thinking out of the box. And I, like I said, I am happy to keep highlighting these because. Not everyone is a fit for every person. So sometimes, you know, maybe Peter is going to, you're going to really connect with him or you did with somebody else. But the point is to take this, this intimidation factor away. There are people like you out there that do want to help people too much. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I, I always say it's very important that when you do find a good accountant that you trust them and you feel comfortable asking them questions, no matter how many times you have to ask them. Right. That's the truth. Because I know I put myself in the shoes of, of, you know, our listeners, our people, our colleagues listening. And if they're longtime listeners, they've heard me tell the stories over and over again about my husband and his friend who's our CPA and la, 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 la. So I'm not going to go through it, you know. But sure. the, the fact is, is that I know from experience that when I have questions of my husband that relate to the financial end of our business, very often with the taxes or the quarterlies or the, you know, yada, yada, all this language, I will sit there and ask him to clarify two, three, four, five times. And of course, he sometimes looks at me like, you are killing me right now. Go away from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I can say to him, I don't care. You need to tell me. But you there's an intimidation to a, a professional that's a CPA across the desk where you think, well, I've asked them twice and now I still don't get it. Maybe I shouldn't ask again, but that can't be. This is your money, right? Yep. 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 Yes. And I've heard many stories where I'll get a new client and they'll say, my last accountant screamed at me. And I <gasps> thought to myself, how can that be? You're paying them Whoa. to get advice and you're getting screamed at. I just... I just can't see it. That's horrible. I, I literally just got goosebumps when you said that. Like literally, I just my brain just went, what? Somebody yeah. screamed at you? Like hopefully that's the moment they walked out and left and went to hire you, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's horrible. That's it. No matter what you know or what you don't know, you are the client at the end of the day, and it is you paying their hourly, their fee, their services, and you demand at the very least a modicum of respect, right? Correct. Okay. So now you specialize in interior designers. And do you want to share with us how that came to be, that you started sure. specializing there? So after I left that firm that um, that said I helped people too much, I worked in a smaller firm. And um, 
the the gentleman that I had worked for at the time had a relationship with a book bookkeeper who referred um, quite a bit of interior design clients in the Boston area. Um, so I was a contractor at the time, and in the summer. Um, I was looking for work to do, so I started to actually go to uh, different design firms and just help them with just about anything. Everybody needed help, and I got I got busy doing that. And as I spent more and more time in those firms and helping them, I I enjoyed working for them. And so fast forward a couple of years, and I was working on my own, and I had I would just started to get bored. I said, you know, if a, another tax return to do, what can I do? And I said, I want to niche in something. So what I did was I looked at a, a list of all my clients um, besides, you know, what what they did. And I said, who do I get along with the most? Who, who do I think I can give the most value to? And when I got done, six out of 10 or seven out of 10 on the list were interior designers. And, and there it was. It was on the list right there. So um, I kind of uh, started by telling my current interior design clients what I wanted to do. And everyone was on board. They thought it was a great idea. And it's just kind of built from there. Isn't that something? Well, and and by the way, Peter, we have the same process that we talk about on the show with interior designers for attracting and working with their ideal client. As we ask them, take a look at your projects. Which ones are the ones that you're the happiest? Are they the full service? Are they the one-day consultations? Are they just the strictly color consultations? Because there's no right or wrong. There's no one's better than another. It's what is the one that really is the type of work and project that makes you the happiest to do. And then zero in on it, right? (laughs) Correct. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you want to you want to be happy when you're working. Exactly. I love it. That's awesome that it happened that way for you. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because it's been happening a lot, Peter, in the last year or so, I've been doing a lot of one on one coaching with interior designers. And I have this process where once they sign up and they have uh, selected if they're going to do one hour or they're going to do blocks of three hours, whatever it might be that they're going to do then they get a questionnaire because I want to start the conversation up to speed are they one are they a solo do they have employees are they in business a minute or 20 years what's the parameters and I have to say one of the things that happen so often and I actually get very sad when I see it I will ask the question what was your uh, gross revenue, gross sales for the calendar year previous, and what was your net earnings, your net profit for the calendar year previous. And very, very often, three out of five times, sometimes four out of five times, the number will be listed as the same number. Mm -hmm. And you and I know that that's not possible for it to be the same number. But explain why a lesser experienced business person is confused by it and thinks it's the same number. Okay. Yep. So your gross receipts is the total amount of money that have come in that has come in throughout a certain time period, whatever is being asked. But that's the net profit is the amount that you made after you had to spend all the money on your expenses. So we're talking about money in, money out. So gross receipts is all the money that came in during the year. And then net profit is whatever you have left after you have to Uh, after all of the cash went out during the year. Exactly. And so uh, for taking smaller numbers, if somebody were to charge somebody $2,000 for a sofa and the sofa cost them $1,600, $2,000 is the gross receipt and $400 is the net profit on that. Correct. Right. Right. Okay. So, but it's, the thing is that it's not clearly understood often. And this is, to me, when I see that disconnect of that understanding, it is one of the first places that we have to start. Because if we don't have that grasp of that difference, then it gets very hard, to my mind, to track sales and earnings and to set goals for sales and earnings, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Because... Really, um, you should be. You can set goals for gross revenue, and that's fine. But um, you need to make sure that you are keeping track of expenses too. So um, sometimes we just set goals of this is what I, we, this is what our goal is for profit, because at the end of the day, that's what you're able to take home. Right, right. And there's two things that happen in here: is that 
my husband always has this saying, which is, if you made a million dollars, but you spent a million and one, seriously, you you did not have a million dollar business, right? No, no you didn't. <laughs> right? And so, and so, and I find, I'm learning, I'm finding that there is a big disconnect in tracking expenses and then monitoring the health of your business based on what is left over as your net profits for that, that business. And so... One of the things that I think that that contributes to this being so difficult is the nature of the interior design business. So you could close a deal with a client and it could be for a very high number, right? The, the project could have a very high number attached to it and then that gets mistaken as money in my firm. Tell, tell us how that happens to designers. Sure. So if you are, uh, if you present a client with a contract for, let's say, even a million dollar project, and they are able to write you a check for a million, you go to the bank, you deposit it, and the next day you log into your bank account and it says you have a million dollars. Um, I have had clients before who call me and say, now that we have a million dollars, I can go buy a, a vacation home, right? Mm. Um, and I say, no, 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 no. <laughs> no Wait no, a minute. Don't go out. <laughs> you have not purchased anything for the project yet. Uh, we don't know how much employees, uh, how much help are you going to need? How, you're going to have to pay employees. What are your other expenses. Um, and so at the end of the day, I would say, going back to what you had said, if, if, if you are a company that has a million dollars in gross receipts, you're doing well. Right. But if you're making negative one dollars, you're not doing well. So right. um, we need to concentrate on, on, on those expenses and, and the best way to get you a profit so you feel like you're, you have a successful business. Right. And, and now let's bring it back down to d- the designers that are possibly going to have, say, fifty to eighty or fifty to a hundred thousand dollars in gross revenues this year. Okay. Okay. So let's sure. bring it to that level because probably the designer that is going to have a million to two million dollars in gross revenues probably has a bookkeeper on staff and probably is meeting with their accountant at least quarterly, right? Correct. We're yes. going to hope that. Okay? I hope so. Yes. Hope so. Yep. <laughs> but it's it's when we start our business that we aren't even aware what we need to know in order to work with our accountant or how to understand the differences between these these this gross revenue and net profit. So how, one of the things you tell me, one of the things that I like to ask everybody is what like my, I have to, you know, I'm stealing it from my husband. I learned it from him. All this stuff I learned from my husband, be serious. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, you know, he, we have this thing in window works. What does it cost to keep the doors open? So what does it cost every month to keep the doors open? Our gas, our electric, our electric, our salaries that we pay out, um, you know, the, the accountant fees, everything. Like we know exactly what that costs every month. And then what we do from there is we say, well, say it costs us $150,000 to be open every single month at Window Works. Then we look at each other and we're like, well, you know, if we only sell $150,000, we theoretically only netted seventy five. So we're in the hole, $75,000 this month. But if mm-hmm. we sell three hundred, dollars theoretically, we should be earning one hundred and fifty. dollars But, you know, we're like, well, well, let's learn a little more than that. We don't want to just break even. And so that conversation, I find, is also a difficult conversation for interior designers. It's harder for them to project because the pipeline goes up and down. But t- tell me how you help help a new business owner, a new interior designer start to grasp these concepts of how they do this and, and know what they're, they're selling, but what they're needing to keep aside and all of that. Sure. So um, we're back to the expense part. And I always start by asking, what are the fixed expenses right. that you have to have in order to keep a business open? Right. And then we come up with um, maybe some variable expenses that maybe aren't going to happen every month, but are going to come up. And then we talk about, okay, what is your expectation to start? Because uh, uh, to start on how much money you expect to bring home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I say, okay, well, then in order to do that, we're going to need revenues of whatever amount. And if they say, well, I don't make that, then then we have to look at um, 
making cuts and and um, and doing that. But we start with basically we start with a cash flow statement and mm-hmm. we figure out exactly what is needed uh, to keep the business open and then and then we assess what kind of projects, what they think uh, the project line looks like. Um, the pipeline looks like for X, Y, Z amount of months, um, going forward. But, um, targeting those expenses are, are, is very important. And I think it's important for, um, because a lot of business owners say I start a business. I expect to be making some money. I, I expect to be making a profit and that's fine. But, um, then we have to adjust and make sure we're, uh, doing a really good job of keeping track of expenses in order to to make that profit. Mm -hmm. I think that um, there's a couple of different things in there that I can grab on and go down a road. One is in staying on the expense thread for this moment is that what I find is that it's very easy to underestimate the waste that happens in a business and to not place great importance on it and to say, well, I mean, you know, you know, I remember when I was in uh, college for a minute and a half, um, my (laughs) my best friend was an accounting major. And I remember her, her mother and father had her on the tightest leash budget wise. Okay. And she was in a very heavy workload of school and so she had very limited time to work extra hours but she really did want to do all the things that the rest of us were doing going out and you know different things and so when something was coming up I remember her saying things like well if when I go to the cafeteria instead of buying this this and this and a milk every day and I just or a coffee every day and I get water three days a week I will save X amount over the month and by the time we do this I can go in the in on the shore house I mean she would literally plan like that for wow. months. yeah like it was insane I would like look at her and go wait so you're gonna save three dollars a week and that's gonna turn into four hundred and fifty dollars for your half of the sh- your portion of the shore house she's like exactly here's my charts <laughs> wow. and so so I married this type of personality. My husband is the same, right? But it really, these two, these two individuals, both my friend from college and my husband, it impressed upon me not to overlook any little line item, to go through and do that. And so in the line of expense, I like that you say you look at fixed expenses, you take into account variable expenses, because when you lock these down and you don't um, neglect them and you don't underestimate their importance is it leaves you the money for the profit at the end. It leaves yep. you the money for that column where you can pay yourself a little bit more than you might have realized, right? Yeah, and we, we start with the client telling us what fixed and variable is, but maybe after a conversation we say, well, is that really fixed? Do you mm. really need it right now or is it something that we can do or can you get it cheaper? Right. Can, you know, can we find it cheaper if we just try a little bit and then all of a sudden that makes our profit a little bit bigger and and it's worth the work that you're doing. Absolutely. And it's funny that you say, can we get it cheaper? Because another terrific habit that we have at Window Works that my husband does, of course, um, <laughs> is that every year he evaluates all of our fixed expenses. And I just shared this on a coaching call with a designer last week who was in 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 uh in distress because she was not seeing the profit margins that she wanted to see was not making money. She, the language wasn't that not making was feeling like I'm running in a circle and not making money. And one of the things that I suggested that she do, I said, you know, my husband even goes every single year and looks at things like the phone plan for the partners because, you know, Verizon doesn't call you up and say, there's a different phone plan and you can save more money if you just oh, yeah. switch this, no. right? And yeah, you, you have to work on that. Too. Right. And so he does that every single January. He goes through every fixed expense and he will just evaluate, can he move it, can he this? And when I shared this with this coaching client last week, do you know the next day I got an email and she she said, I called Verizon and there is a lesser expensive plan and I will save $720 this calendar year because I made that switch. That's great. Right? I mean, now she says now whatever ends up, but now she's made an extra 720 that she can 
by a phone call, and, by a yep. phone call, $720, you know, that could be a car payment for her that month, right? I mean, you know, two car payments, whatever, yeah. it depends. So, and so I feel like these are the kinds of conversations that are important to point out to younger, newer business owners that every little thing, it isn't just, hey, people, you know what they always say, what are they, what's that thing where, you know, it's the, the the person has the money because they watch the money, right? If you don't watch, what's under some saying like that? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what it is, but <laughs> anyway, so I so I like that. And so when we when you start to work with a newer business owner, a newer interior designer, it you sit down and you start to just explain these basic principles to them, right. where they can look at their fixed pr- expenses and their variable and so forth like that. And the other thing that happens a lot, um, and uh, not to pick on interior designers, but it's it's something that happens where they see uh, other maybe more successful designers and they say, well, in order to get that big client, I got to drive that whatever, that really nice car or I've got to have the that perfect suit. Mm. And that's, you know, that's that's where you can get into trouble. Now you're spending more money than you're making and it and it just becomes uh, um, you're you're just. You're just climbing a mountain starting from – and that may not be true. Um, you, There's plenty of work out there, I always say. So let's wait until we're making money and we know we can afford it and then we do – then we can do the upgrades. Right. So it sounds like to me is not only what you do find is that designers are not profitable and don't un- – and because they don't understand that they're not profitable. But then you also find that you have had clients that knowingly will go into debt on things that are, are not really good ROI to go on debt at out, out the gate. Absolutely. That oh. happens. That happens all the time. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us if you can think of some scenarios and some situations that maybe we can pick some lessons out from that. I'm um, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I could, we kind of were talking, we were talking a little bit about, um, uh, when you get a contract and you get a uh, hundred thousand or 500,000 and then, um, I have met clients that it's too late before they know me and they have, you know, bought the Land Rover with cash because of it. And now they have oh. major credit card issues because, um, they have to continue with the project and they got to put on the credit card and, and it becomes a, a, a bad spiral. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that can happen. Um, so is when that, when that happens, Peter, are you finding that it really is because In other words, it wasn't a blatant negligence. It wasn't, I understand that I just received a $50,000 contract from a client and they happened to give me the $50,000 payment. It's not that they really understood that they needed, you know, three quarters of that for cost of goods or half of that for cost of goods. It's that they really didn't get it and they thought they had $50,000. Oh yeah, they did. And they thought that, and then they spent the money on that item because they, in their head, they thought, I need to have that in order to get that next project or to get a $250,000 contract or a million-dollar contract. I need that. That's really considered a business expense because it's helping me grow my business. Mm. So and, because – right, because when somebody takes – I'm going to go back to 100 because it's so much easier for me math-wise. But so if somebody sure. takes a $100,000 project, if they're working on a 20% markup or a 30% markup on, on cost of goods, which is – typical for designers right then Mm -hmm. they need to reserve 70,000 or 80,000 of that to run that project yes and with the clients that I have we try to open up different bank accounts so that let's say that con that contract for a hundred thousand the client writes the check for a hundred thousand we put it in a different um different bank account we have a bank account for that we have a bank account for sales tax we have or um or a different one for income tax and then uh we have an operating account we try to figure out what that profit is going to be now of course there could be mistakes there Mm -hmm. could be extra work that needs to be done but we come up with that estimate we put it in the operating account and i like to (laughs) so that my clients can only see that and say, okay. Mm-hmm. And then they understand like, okay, this is how much I have to it. operate with. And then we talk about it. And then when they say, I need this, I need that. It says, okay, well, this is how much we have for the month. Um, 
and it's almost like if they don't see those other accounts, then there's no um, there's that hopefully that desire goes away to use money that's already been allocated or needs to be allocated for something else. Right. So in that example, what we're saying is they've taken a hundred thousand dollar contract, they get paid a hundred thousand dollars up front. Let's just say eighty thousand is cost of goods and twenty thousand is hopefully expected to be profit. You're saying that the twenty goes into the operating account because that's what they're going to pay their lights and their bills and their all their salaries and stuff with. And the eighty is going into an account that is going to be used to purchase the sofas and the rugs and the contractors for that project. Exactly. Right. Yep. Okay. So, so when it sure comes time to yep, when it comes time to. Uh, make those payments, whether it's a 50% deposit for a vendor um, or even 100% or whatever that is, all the money that's going to the vendors for the sofa and the curtains and those items are is already in there and it's, it's there. coming out of that account. Right. It's not. You didn't spend it on something else and then you don't have it. And that reminds me, I think you and I mentioned off air, that reminds me of the profit first way of doing a business. And we had Michelle Williams on the show on episode 180 and talking all about the profit first philosophy for running your accounting for your interior design, well, for any business, but right? That's what that yeah. is based on. I yeah. love I love profit first. It's it's a wonderful. Um, I do too. Yeah, so. I do too because it really um, helps you when you know. I, I'm not calling anybody out on this. Everybody that listens to the show knows that I am the least financial brain on the planet. I'm just exactly. <laughs> Like all my friends, I can't add and subtract in my head, yada, yada, yada. But where I am different is that, A, I've had the benefit of having and been in business with my husband for all these years. And I've long since learned from him the importance of these things and have had the value of being able to have these in-depth conversations to understand and learn this. And by the way, I still don't understand all of it. I still, if he were not in business with me, would need somebody like you peter that really yep. would because as much as i've learned it's not my wheelhouse but the thing is that you have to you can't ignore this you can't just rely on the stranger cpa or the old school cpa to just show up once a year with the with the reality check of here's your tax return and you're either made money or you did not and you have taxes due or you didn't because mm -hmm. you cannot be surprised like that right no, it's too late then yeah. yeah and and i always tell people what whether you are happy with a, a an accountant like myself that specializes in the interior design business or even um a, a different type of accountant. The most important thing is, um, and I think I already said this, but the most important thing is to trust that person mm. so that there is a constant communication and you can ask questions so that there's no surprises because that's, that's not for an accountant that cares. The worst is, is having to spring that surprising news to someone during tax season. Mm -hmm. because that's that's just it's no fun you're not like you didn't really give any value to your client by doing that um and i didn't get into business for that i got into business for helping my clients grow their business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love it i think it's awesome are there other uh pitfalls that you can think of that in your experience that are specific to the way designers because our business is a design business is different you know the the net profit margins are different and then you have you know you have a, uh, revenue from for say design fees which mm -hmm. your hourly work is attached to it but there's no product attached to that so there's different way, revenue streams that come into an interior design firm and how do you help a designer navigate those uh things when it comes to their bank accounts and setting themselves up for success Sure. Yeah, because you could do a project where it's all labor and it's 100% profit versus what we were talking about before, where it's 20% profit. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people when they start, when they're starting out too, there's clients that say, "Oh, I just, I just use a spreadsheet to do my accounting, or I do it on my own." And I say, if there's, if there's one thing when we talk about fixed expenses, if there's one thing that I would tell you to do from the beginning is find the right. Uh, software that's going to help you with your project and with your accounting, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Um, but but that's something that um, there are there are many good options out there, and right. um, and it's important to do that because um, 
the spreadsheet you're you're still running the spreadsheet right, right. so you're 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 if you those, don't understand it and you're the one putting it in you still can make mistakes <laughs> and if you're an interior designer and you started a business you didn't we already said this before but you didn't start the business to sit at your desk and do accounting and figure out spreadsheets right. you wanted to design amazing projects and keep your clients happy so finding the right teammate and um, finding the right account that's going to grow your business, but also finding the the software, whatever it is, that's gonna uh, that you feel comfortable using, and that's gonna allow you to build your business and and make sure that your taxes are being paid and you're making money. That's that's mm-hmm. the key. Mm-hmm. I we I interviewed FreshBooks on the show, and they had sponsored a few episodes. They their their premise. And they they convinced me to what level, you know, in an hour conversation you can convince somebody of something. But mm-hmm. their premise is that they are an accounting uh, software that is more in, – it's, it's, it's been developed more intu- to run more intuitive to the way a creative thinks. Do you have experience because you have QuickBooks, you have FreshBooks? And that was the little nudge when they came on the show that they wanted to say to me that – we run it more intuitively so that a creative who it's not their wheelhouse can manage and run it more easily than say a QuickBooks or something. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I do. I do think, well, a couple of things. One is I think that that is true and they do make it more, um, uh, easily understandable for the small business owner, whereas like a QuickBooks is catering towards the accountant, right? So if you have an accountant that says oh, you have okay. to be on QuickBooks, that's because they don't know any different. That's um, making the other their thing, life easier. Yes, exactly. <laughs> which, you know, who's paying the bill, right? right, right, right. Um, the other thing with FreshBooks that I like is that it's a cloud-based software. You, mm. you, can, you can be anywhere um, I have a, a couple of clients that use FreshBooks. You can, they can be anywhere on a project, um, or I can be anywhere, and we can log in and see the same thing at the same time, which is which is which is awesome for technology and cloud-based accounting software. Mm-hmm. It's great. I've had a couple of clients that I met in Boston that have since moved to New York or California um, or Michigan. It doesn't really matter. With technology and cloud-based software, we're able to see things and solve problems at the same time. And that's been the most exciting thing about this is um, being able to off- offer my services to designers all over the country because of the Internet. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. Yes, that that is interesting. I mean, they, you know, it's funny to know because I didn't ask you that question ahead of time. You could have come down either way on it. But um, I did get the impression that it was easier. And again, putting myself in the shoes of my friends out there is that it's already hard to do. So why do we need something that, that that's supposed to be a tool to make it easier? <laughs> that right. doesn't, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it just seems it's it's like anything else. If you can get yourself in the habits and the systems and the processes of starting to track it and then paying attention and then you sit with somebody like yourself that's willing to listen and answer questions and explain things it's 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 the foundation for running the financial part of your business i mean there's no point in being in business it's a hobby if you're not making money that's just the bottom line right and, and you and you have a vision and you and it's important to have uh, processes so that you can you know how to follow them and you can create these projects so whether it's an accounting based software or um, whatever kind of project management software that that you feel comfortable with those are the important things that are going to keep your business running in a successful way. Exactly, so. exactly. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about very often when you open your business in the beginning, you by default become a sole proprietor, the entity, the legal entity called sole proprietor as opposed to I'm not talking about a solo entrepreneur, okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. And and that sometimes is perfectly fine and other times it's not fine. So can you tell us what it what is that tipping point and and is it something that can be changed and what are your feelings on that versus being an LLC or a subcorp and a sub S corp and all of that stuff 
Yep. So you can be an LLC and be a sole proprietor or an S corp. First of all, so the LLC is a, a more of a legal thing. Okay. Um, and if you did set up as a sole proprietor, that's okay. You're like 95% of um, other people that start a business. So the good news is is that um, the good news is is that if you realize that you can be something else, it can be changed at any time. You just have to make sure that you have the right accountant that knows how to do it, right? So I always say, and this is a very um, broad overview. I don't want anyone to hear this and say, well, I did this, um, he said this, so this is what I should be. But when my clients are operating as a sole proprietor, and I'm talking about profit, so I'm talking about gross revenue minus all your expenses. When we start to see that profit number get around forty to $50,000 a year and things are really um, doing very well, you're, you're adding on, you're scaling, and you know that that number is only going to go up, that's when I approach my clients and say, you know, it's time to start thinking about becoming an S corporation. And an S corporation basically, um, basically means you have to file a separate return and then you're becoming like an entity and your that entity is now paying yourself out with what's called a reasonable compensation. So now you're going to start to receive that paycheck. So if anyone's in business but before that they had a job, you know, you got your check every week or two weeks or once a month mm-hmm. and they took taxes out. Right. So now you're you you're the owner but you're also the employee. Um and not to get too complicated in that, but the what's a benefit where we see like around forty or fifty thousand is we can start to talk about the reasonable compensation amount um, because with a sole proprietor you have your um, you have your income tax and there's an additional self employment tax and the IRS charges both on the entire amount of profit okay but when you have an S corp and we come up with a a reasonable compensation which could be like 60% of that number or 70% of that number it's all it's a vague thing but it's based on um, based on the industry well whatever that difference is that you're you're not paying yourself the 40% to to the 25% you you don't have to pay self-employment tax so I've found with that um, on average when we get to around I do the numbers and I say to my clients well we can set you up as an S corp your fees are going to go up, yes, but you have an extra tax return. But I, you know, we we're looking at saving you four to five thousand a year forever, mm-hmm. not just once, forever. Right. Right. And you're going to grow. Then it makes sense to jump over and do that. I've had clients that have gotten up to, you know, their profits have gone up to a hundred thousand, and I've done the calculation for them, and I say, you know, we're 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 okay, we're going to do this, and I can save you $10,000 mm-hmm. a year. And they say to me, well, how much extra is it going to cost? <laughs> and I say $2,400. Well, I'll think about it. And I'm like, what? I'm, what? I'm sorry, what right? is there to think about? <laughs> so these are the kind of things that we do for our clients. We give them all their options. Now, at the end of the day, they have to make their own decisions. Sure. But when I get to that point, and they're like, I have to think about it. It's like, well, I hope you don't have to think about it for too long. Like, do you really trust me or not? Like, so um, if you're operating, and that just means the understanding isn't quite there yet. They've heard it, but it's not really clearly understood at that moment yet. And that's a good challenge because then when they leave, I say, okay, how do I change how I explained it? I thought I did, but how do I change it to explain it? And and then sometimes that's just a matter of me asking more questions. Mm to see and then eventually it comes out what the concern is through the question answer. And then when that happens, the light bulb I can see goes yes. off and then it's like, okay, great. And then the reassurance, whatever you were worried about is not true. And then we can uh, we can go from there. And then when the tax returns are done and they can see the differences when I've done my job and um, hopefully everybody's happy. Mm, yeah, so uh, let me just clarify in there some of that conversation, okay? Sure. You're going to check me if I understand properly. So when you're a – well, I understand S-Corp clearly, very easily because that's what we are at Window Works. So S-Corp is that there's an entity that is the S-Corp, and I'm an employee of that S-Corp. Luann Nigara is an employee of that thing, and that corporation gives me a paycheck every single week. That I understand. Yep. When you're a sole proprietor – 
the difference is, and this is what I'm asking you to check, is sure. that even if I quote unquote think I'm getting a paycheck every week, so in other words, even if I am actively giving myself money every week, I'm not taking, that isn't, as far as the government and taxes are concerned, that is not me getting a paycheck. That is me getting a profit share every week. Is that that distinction? What is that there? Yes, that's, yes, that's true. And in S Corp, you could, you could also, because this is this can be confusing. You can also get that payroll check as an employee, but you can also um, take extra money out in the form of a distribution. Exactly. So um, that's that's the biggest concern that I get when I explain it, because when I say, well, you know, we're going to do a reasonable salary, and it's sixty percent, let's say. Right away, I think clients will think, well, I can take 100% out now, and now you're telling me I can only take 60% out. I need that money to live, mm-hmm. which is not true, and then you know that's, that's something. But um, just to go back, and these, these are not exact percentages because I, I, I realize this is an extremely boring topic and I don't <laughs> want to lose anyone, but the self-employment tax rate – which is different from the income tax rate that you that you pay based on your income is is like a set let's say 15% for the sake of argument that everybody has to pay and and it's the same for everyone. So what we're trying to do when we move to the S corp is limit that how much you have to pay on that extra 15% because if you're a sole proprietor you're paying 15% on that entire profit right. which once again the profit is the IRS is only concerned with the amount that you made after all your expenses. Right, 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 right. So it is a little complicated in there. I, and Absolutely. It is. But the, the biggest thing of it is, is that it the thing is set up specifically so that you can – work your way through it and leave more money in your, well, I don't know. I shouldn't say it's set up specifically for that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, that's not it. But the point is that th- with the guidance and the counsel of a CPA like yourself, you can know when it's time to make that switch. And that's the other lesson that I want to make sure we understand. We don't have to be sitting there going, oh my goodness, I'm a sole proprietor. I did it wrong. And it, you're, you're saying until you are earning forty to $50,000 a year net profit, that's not your gross sales, but what's left over in the kitty at the end of the year after you've paid all your vendors, all your contractors, all your cost of goods, all of your gas and electric, your car payments, everything, there's $40,000 left over. It's time to think about this because you can really put more money in your account at the end of the year. Right. There are tax planning opportunities when you get in that range that if it's not time at this moment, it may be in the future. And um, like I said before, it's something that a good accountant will know about and can help you at any time during the year. Yeah, I um, like that. Every, anything can be changed, even um, even if it even if it's late, like this late in the year, we could still retroactively do it and and make sure that you're being counted for the entire 2018 calendar year. Oh, that's interesting. So if you're a firm and you are scaling up a little bit and you're starting to see that growth and you're looking ahead and you are monitoring your your finances and you can see that the projection is coming, that this is going to be that good year and you have the expectation that now the engine is running and it's going to continue this way, you can go do it now in July. Of the yes. Middle of the year. That's interesting. I always tell clients that before uh, December 31st, we have a lot more options than after the, you know, after January rolls around, and then and then um, not all of our options, but some of the options. Then the door closes on that, and then we have to worry about you know doing things in the following year. But right. until that happens, there is um, opportunities for tax planning and just um, planning in general mm-hmm. that that can be done retroactively. So to summarize it, it sounds like there are two things that we really want to impress upon 
our buddies listening is that it's very, 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 very important at the beginning of your business to get a handle on all of these concepts and to be working with someone that has empathy for the industry and, and a knowledge of the industry and the different ways that you bring revenue into your business because it is a different model than running a grocery store. I mean, it's just completely different. And Absolutely. so, yes, yeah, so it's important that the person you're working with have respect for it and understand it. And it's important at the beginning that you ask enough questions so that you understand it. But then there's the second time that it's important is when your business is starting to scale. Maybe you're in business five or eight or 10 years and you really are starting to stack more and more profit month after month, one on top of an, each month on top of itself. And there might be a, a the point where it's time to reevaluate and sit with your accountant and really make sure that you are. It's like the recalibration of calling Verizon. Honestly. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is what's happening now. Is this the best way for it to be happening, or could I be saving money by doing it a different way? Absolutely. Yeah, I love yep. it. I love and, it. And you want to make sure that you can get your accountant on the phone. And I, I just, just a quick story is I've, I've had some clients eventually tell me that you know they, they felt bad and they stayed maybe with their accountant for a couple of years too long, but. Mm -hmm it's your business and it's, it's the work that you're doing. And if, if, if you, you need to have, I, I think it's one of the most valuable team members to have. And if you're not comfortable, there are people out there that, that will work with you, that you will find to be comfortable. And it's important to keep going until you find that person. It's a great point because it is a tough thing to do. It's one thing when someone is disrespecting you and marginalizing you and even, as you described in the beginning, yelling at you. That's an easy break, right? That's mm -hmm. an easy break. Yeah. But when somebody is just maybe ineffective – or non-counseling and non-proactive, not being proactive, but you're not really aware of the the ways that it's negatively affecting your business, it's tougher to fire that person and to move on. But your point is well made. If you're gonna work your 40, 50, 60 hours a week all through the year, there's no reason that you should be doing this without somebody side by side that's helping you and guiding you and counseling you so that you are putting as much as you possibly can at the end of the year into your pocket. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a tough thing, but you know, you got to do it. So, all righty. Well, Peter, so awesome. Thank you so much for explaining all of this to us. And uh, your website is thedesignercpa.com, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. And you're on Facebook at the designer CPA.com. You're actually you're actually a CPA on Instagram. I, did I am, not yeah. noticed that. That's yep. just, well where well, your target client is here, right? That's right. <laughs> and I I would say um to go on Instagram I've I've uh versus Facebook because I've I've really tried we've tried to uh work with Instagram more and um if anyone has any ideas for my Instagram account I'd be happy to listen to them because <laughs> It's been actually pretty fun to work with Instagram. I've, I feel oh, young again. <laughs> that's hysterical. Oh, my goodness. That's so funny. Could you, oh, I just looked at it. You have a pretty nice feed. <laughs> Thank you. It's not all spreadsheets, people. <laughs> no, it's not. No, we try to cater to what you want to look at. Oh, that's awesome. That's terrific. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Peter. Thank you for having me. Right off the bat, I want to tell you, if you just listened to Albie Boisbang's show last Tuesday, Albie, if you haven't, listen to it, because Albie said she took a full year off of social media and asked herself the questions that she needed in order to get to the very essence of what she wanted her business to look like. And one of the questions was she explored which clients made her the happiest. And did you hear? That's exactly what Peter did. So... He sat and said, this isn't working for me. I'm not loving what's happening here in this firm, in this industry. But what does make me happy? Which clients, when I'm working with them, am I enjoying the process? And it's you. He wants to work with you, the interior designer. So how cool would it be to work with a CPA who actually chooses you as his ideal client? 
you are his target client. When you call him, he starts doing his happy dance, okay? So with this thought, I have two comments that I want you to consider. The first is, if you need a CPA, send Peter an email and let him know that you learned about him here on the podcast, okay? And see if you two are a fit. My second thought is, to take the lesson from this, if you have been afraid to narrow and to niche your firm, think about the safe, the safe feeling that you just had when you considered that on the other end of the phone was a CPA who actually, when you say, I'm an interior designer, I'm interested in how your services work, that he smiled. Okay, so think about that safe feeling that you got, the happiness of knowing if you called Peter, he specifically wants to hear from exactly you. Well, your ideal client deserves the same feeling, this feeling of knowing that you are a business owner's favorite client to work with. So if you've been resisting niching, think about it. Think about that feeling that when a client sees that you are out there specifically trying to attract exactly them. It's not weird. It's great, right? It's, it's amazing to have that feeling. So I say, go for it. All right. And I also, I mean, oh my goodness, I have to (laughs) say this. You know me with numbers. And when I'm trying to do numbers off the top of my head, I have to try and pick examples that I can at least attempt to do some calculation in real time at the top of my head. So I'm just going to say to you, your margins should not be 20% on projects, okay? Do not pay attention to that 80-20 ratio I was using. 80-20 popped in my head, and then I started to think about how I can't change that. I don't know what to do. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm, I, I, I promise you, I'm good at a lot of things. This is not my zone of genius, all right? Now, you should be at a minimum, bare minimum, 35% margin, and I truly want you to make strides to actually be 40% and on to 50% or more. I'm not joking. I'm not kidding, really. Okay. So, and I can say that, um, ask anybody that's coached with me in a one-on-one coaching environment, you know, I have all the tools I need. I have the calculator and I have a pen and paper and I can think straight, not the pressure of thinking on my feet and trying to do numbers. Uh Uh-uh, not my superpower. All righty. Please, if you're interested and want to learn more about Peter, you can email him at peter at thedesignercpa.com. And his website is thedesignercpa.com. He's also there on Instagram, as we talked about in the show. So go ahead, follow him and check him out. Okay. All righty. What are you going to do today? I ask you every show, what are you going to do? What was your moment? What was your, the unlock moment that you had? I hope you had one in this show and I hope you decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.